Mike Steele and today how to preach sermons which are hospitable and have a good reputation with outsiders. Our guest is Peter Adam. Peter, of course, the former principal of Ridley College in Melbourne. And uh, Peter, thank you for joining us. And uh, you were telling me a few months ago uh, that this issue of hospitality has been pressing in on your pastor's heart, particularly as it impacts preaching. Yes, that's right. I've been uh, I've started to uh, write a book on preaching and the first uh, section of the book, first quarter of the book was going to be on the preacher. And I thought because uh, who you are makes a big difference to what you preach. Lots of books on preaching are about the technique or technology of preaching, uh, technique of preaching rather, the art of preaching. But actually who you are as a preacher is really important. So then I thought, well, I'll look through the New Testament and see what uh, the New Testament expects of people in ministry and then think how that should be expressed in preaching. And I came across the great lists in, um, uh, in Timothy and uh, uh, Titus and 1 Timothy, including uh, given to hospitality and well thought of by outsiders. And I thought, well... Uh, that should be a characteristic of the p- people that you choose as ministers. Therefore, it must be expressed in their ministry, on their lives and ministry in every aspect, if you like. They should be given to hospitality and well thought of by outsiders. But then let's think, uh, how does that actually apply to the preaching? So uh, I started to think about hospitable preaching as being welcoming preaching, preaching which goes out of its way to make people feel at home and, um, you know, part of the family as if they've they've come into your house and you're respectfully entertaining them, uh, uh, I mean, receiving them and caring for them. And then, well thought of by outsiders, well, uh, if, if we invite outsiders, I, 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 that means presumably people who aren't yet Christians or who, who are opposed to Christianity indeed, H- how would you invite them into your home? And then how would you invite them into your sermon? So if they came to church, would they feel uh, hospitably welcomed? And would they think well of you as a preacher? It's a dangerous question, of course. Yeah. Uh, 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 with with lots of chasms on either side, but I think uh, it's been it's been profitable to think through it a, a, a little at least. Yeah. Now I've identified a few of those chasms on either side in my mind, but well, why don't you tell us what the chasms are and tell me how you're planning to navigate those chasms? Yes. Well, I think there are two dangers in thinking about um, outsiders, if I can put it, just to use the Bible's word. Uh, one is that we want to rally the Christian troops, and one way to do that, to reassure them that we're right and the outsiders are wrong, is to demean or ridicule the outsider. That is to say how silly they are uh, and how ridiculous it is not to believe in God, and uh, we're the saints and we know how to live the right way and everybody else is wrong. Uh, the other option, of course, is the liberal option, which is to be so uh, so aligned with outsiders that we're, we're just preaching their message, but we're just uh, echoing what outsiders think. Now, I think uh, both of those are damaging, uh, and we need to walk that, that path which doesn't fall into either chasm. Um, I, and I think, to be honest, that my my dan- the danger I've fallen into, the chasm I've fallen into, is to want to so encourage the Christians that I've spoken disparagingly of the views of outsiders, and thus, if an outsider was present, they would feel demeaned or put down. That, that I think, is my danger, actually. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. Um, uh, the... Um I mean, I'm just thinking of that line in 1 Corinthians 14 about you want the outsider to say God is truly among you um, when they hear your sermon. And so how how have you been reflecting on wanting to change your sermons to bring about that response? Well, 
at St. Jude's at Carlton, the church I belong to now, uh, we've been reading, uh, preaching through Romans 9 to 11. And I was given that most difficult verse in uh, Romans, a re- different section in Romans 9 to a, a chapter 11, which includes God has handed everybody over to disobedience that he might have mercy on everybody. And I thought, now, what I'll do is I'll prepare this sermon uh, with uh, the outsider in view, hoping, as of course is often the case, that there'll be people who aren't believers who are uh, listening in or uh, attending the sermon, or listening to the sermon. Uh, but also, I realised that one of the best things I can do for Christians is to help them how to, to think how to present the Christian faith and the Bible's teaching plausibly to outsiders, that is, in the best possible light. Um, So that's both uh, trying to preach to the outsider, but also to encourage Christians to think about how to speak to outsiders. So, uh, in short, what I did was to explain why we in the West, in the 21st century, are so committed to Uh, at the absolute freedom of the individual will. That's a cultural comment, really. And then to point out that actually it was an unrealistic expectation about human free will. And that uh, it was so difficult to become a Christian that you could only do it if God made you a Christian. So that was how I kind of got into 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 the sermon and then expounded the passage, of course. So what I was hoping was that an outsider would think, first, when they first heard the verse, that's ridiculous. And then by the time I'd finished that sermon, that sermon, they'd think, oh, perhaps I need to rethink my opinion. So I was just trying to go onto their territory long enough to give them space to think, well, perhaps there's something in this, or perhaps I need to re, 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 uh, think my view about absolute freedom of will. I'm just thinking uh, the big issue for many of us at the moment is sexuality um, and how we communicate um, God's word in this space. uh, Oh, sorry, how we communicate God's word on this topic in this current cultural climate and particularly recognising that our our sermons are online and um, will be scrutinised by people who are particularly... um, That's right. uh, Well, out to critique us really Um, uh, how have you thought into this space uh, on this thesis yeah well a number of years ago actually I was asked to uh, go to the uh, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology one of our universities Uh, they were having an abortion week that the student union was running an abortion week in which they had uh, uh, were kind of promoting abortion as a wonderful freedom There were coat hangers everywhere, which was fairly gruesome. Um, uh, But the Christian Union invited me to give a talk on a Christian view of abortion. So what I did uh, was to uh, give give my talk in two parts. First of all, I gave um, a Christian view of human life. And then I wanted to take questions on that. And then I was going to, in the second part of the talk, I'd give a Christian view on, on abortion. Well, the, uh, the president of the student union happened to be present. She came along to listen. And when I finished my fir- the first half of my talk on a Christian view of human life, she stood up and said, well, I can't, I can't wait and listen to the next bit of what you're going to say, but I think I understand why you're going to say it. And I thought, well, just presenting a Christian view of human life was really important. Then she could understand why uh, I had the views I have on abortion and so on. So I think uh, if if we don't just say you're wrong, but explain uh, the fuller picture of what the Bible says about human life and human destiny and human uh, human identity, uh, then that's that's the best defence we can make uh, for Christianity and for our views on that particular topic, including the view that our sexuality is not 
our identity, that to view ourselves merely as sexual or primarily as sexual beings is, is so far wide of the mark that it's really unhelpful. I wonder, Peter, if we could just go on a little digression there. Um, uh, I'm sure with the, the current law change uh, underway in Victoria, people are looking to people like you for advice and wisdom on how to navigate um, their activity in the pulpit. Uh, and so w what's your word to fellow Victorian preachers uh, in this season? Uh, well, I, I think uh, don't be cowed for a moment, but speak the truth as you as you as it's revealed in the scriptures. Um, I think my advice uh, when someone's talking to an individual is to, uh, if the individual asks asks for prayer for a change in their uh, sexual activity and uh, identity, uh, ask them to ask them to write down a request for it. For, for the for the prayer. Now, uh, we may still go to prison, but uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, that's happened before. So I don't think we should give away for a moment, but I think we should be uh, explaining the reasons for our attitudes and our pastoral practice and our preaching. It's very helpful. I hadn't I hadn't thought. So you're you're just asking the person to make clear that as an adult, they're asking somebody to pray for them uh, on the matters that they're wanting to pray prayer for, and in no way is this coerced or forced. That's right. Now, that may not work uh, if you're up in the court, but as a matter of public uh, credibility, I think, uh, the fact that you've done it is a good thing to have done. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's helpful. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't thought that through before. Um, let's move to... Um, uh, think a little more on those chasms. And, and one of the thoughts I had was just the idea of um, uh, being a man pleaser and um, just that line in Galatians 1 about the temptation that I have to preach to please men. And when I first heard hospitality, please men, how are those different things? Well, the interesting thing is that Paul doesn't want to please people rather than God. But in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I've become all things to all people that by all possible means I might save some. So yeah. Paul is walking the tightrope, isn't he? He isn't cowed for a moment by what people think. Um, but at the same time, he works hard to present his message in a way which people can understand and receive, not compromising for a moment. So he's a servant-hearted non-compromiser. <laughs> mm. mm. Uh, it's not just serving God, but serving the people, I mean, yeah. Servant-hearted non-compromiser. That's a good line, yeah. I just thought of that. It's quite good, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, hospitality, as it plays out for the pastor, and actually many of us pastors are introverts who spend all our kind of lots of our working hours expanding into people and then think, I haven't got anything left. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm a severe introvert myself. This, this interview is very stressful, I might say. I... <laughs> no, it's not at all. Um, yes. Um, I remember talking with someone in ministry who was an introvert, and uh, he, was, he was saying, you know, how, how weak he was. Now, I said, the good thing about being introvert is that when you're with people, you want to make every moment count. So you're not just with them because you enjoy people and leave, leave it at that. I mean, that's okay to do if you're an extrovert, but you're, you're, you're expending energy being with people. So you want to make the most you can of the situation. And I think uh, the introvert is forced to, forced to focus on the other person very closely, to pay very close attention to what they're saying, to listen to them. Uh, with, whereas the extrovert, excuse me, extroverts, may be so busy with what they want to say next that they're not listening to the person. Mm. And I think attentive listening is a great gift, actually, which we should all, sorry, <laughs> we should all be exercising. Mm. Right. So and there are, I know some notable extroverts who do it really well, I should say. So you're not saying um, hospitality means your home has to be open all the time as a pastor. No, that's right. No. 
That's right. Uh, I, 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 when I went to St Jude's as a vicar in uh, 1982, my predecessor had, had run an open house. People could call in at any time of day or night. And uh, I, I just couldn't manage that. But when I do, when I do meet with people, either at home or in a coffee shop or wherever, um, I work hard to make them, I don't know if I succeed, but I try to work hard to make them feel really welcome, that I'm really pleased to see them, uh, that I'm attentive uh, to what they're saying and to what they're feeling. Uh, and I'm, uh, you know, anxious to be of help to them. Uh, uh, so uh, that's, it's, it's work, uh, but it's enjoyable work, I might say, and rewarding work as well. Mm. Um, I noticed you've spoken of, um, as you prepare the talk and the presentation, thinking about hospitality, half the time in the text, half the time thinking, praying, engaging with how this is going to be received and how this is going to be helpful for the people listening. How does that work out for you? How do you, how do, you do that? Yes, well, this is, this is a relatively new practice. Uh, I used to spend all my time working on the text and having great fun doing that, you know, uh, and then not think very much about the people who are going to receive it. But I realised that actually preaching is not performance but ministry. So I decided to spend half my time uh, on the text and then half my time praying for the people who would receive it, thinking what they how they would respond when they heard the Bible reading. So what would they understand or misunderstand? What would they need to know? Uh, what would they be pleased to hear in the Bible reading? What would they be upset about? Uh, and I do that by thinking uh, often of individuals whom I know, say a, an inquirer, a young Christian, a mature Christian, a wobbly Christian, uh, a Christian who's wandering away. Also, of course, thinking about the church and how the passage applies to the church as a whole. But I'm also saying I should be thinking uh, about the outsider who'll be present. I hope there, there, are, there usually are, there often are, and I should be thinking how can I engage the outsider? So something like, you may have never heard anything like this before, but let me, uh, let me give you a clue about how to understand this passage. So um, I, I'll, I'll address people who are outsiders, if I put it that way. You know, you, you've never re read this Bible passage before. Well, let me just give you a clue about how to approach it all. You wonder what this word means. Well, here's an insight. Uh, oh, actually, I once heard uh, Tim Keller speaking, and he said, we preach to people we know uh, and we've been talking to. And he said, he said, I remember, my problem is I talk to so many non-Christians that my sermons are addressed to non-Christians and not to Christians. Uh, and he said, I, ha I need help in applying my sermons to Christians. Uh, and I think that's very helpful. The, the people we're thinking about, we've been talking to, are the people who will, if, if you like, inhabit our minds as we're preparing our sermons. Just as you say that, I, I remember a line somebody said once, uh, don't preach to the people who are there, preach to the people that you wish were there. Um, yes. And so if I'm communicating as if there is a particular group of people in the audience, then one day there will be. Um, yes, uh, not least because the people who are there will think, oh, well, my friend who does have the, this viewpoint would be interested in this preacher. Yeah. So yeah. If, if we're always preaching, as it were, to Christians and caring for them and not addressing non-Christians, then Christians will be less likely to bring people who aren't yet Christians, who are not Christians, along to hear us. How does this subject of hospitality relate to the issue of humour? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, I... I um, I am a humorist. Because humour always has a victim. <laughs> There's always a victim of my joke. Do you know? That's right. and, yes, yeah. that's right. Sorry, that's I interrupted right. you. 
And I must confess, when I, uh, in my younger years, I used to, um, you know, pick on somebody in the congregation whom I knew and make fun of them or something like that. And then I thought, no, that's a silly thing to do because an outsider will think, well, if I come along next Sunday, he might pick on me and make fun of me. So I repented of that <laughs> unhelpful. It, it was a great crowd pleaser, but uh, not a helpful practice. So I use humour about myself. Uh, I, I do many silly things, uh, and I make most the, the use of that in, in sermons. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that makes sense in terms of making myself the victim of the joke. Do you know, I'm, yeah, I'm free to do that, just not free to make you the victim of my joke. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes, and I make so many mistakes that uh, there are plenty of sermon illustrations uh, there. <laughs> I was preaching recently, and uh, I was la- I was almost late for the service because I'd been using my you know nev person uh, thing, but also half remembered which way to go. So between uh, he- he- having two pieces of advice on how to get there, I got lost. So the apl- the application was: don't be double minded. Of course, um, <laughs> pay-, pay attention to God alone. That was an easy one. Yeah. Sarcasm is, um, is, I guess, particularly a problem there. Um, I, in fact, I, I, in fact, used it recently in a sermon. I was preaching uh, on uh, Isaiah 38 and 39, King Hezekiah. And uh, I said, of course, you'll remember where, you'll remember Hezekiah's, the mention of Hezekiah in the New Testament. And there were blank looks around the room. <laughs> so I said, oh, I'm surprised, you know, you don't remember Hezekiah in the New Testament, which was a, uh, a sarcastic comment and not helpful. I, re- I repent of it. Um, yes, I, th- I think we, we have to model a, a style of public communication which is of a higher moral standard than the society around us. When you think about the communica- public communication we hear, we hear it from uh, journalists, from politicians, uh, and from advertising uh, ad- and advertisements. And uh, I think we need to model a higher standard of communication. And sarcasm is an easy way of putting somebody down, but I think is not a very good expression of loving your neighbour. I guess in the end you're speaking of winning people, not arguments. Yes, there's the challenge. Uh, in college we learn to win arguments, <laughs> but the task of ministry is to win people. Um, and not only that, Dominic, but uh, we should be modelling a right way of communication uh, and relationship. So. Um, Peter, Peter says, or Peter says, uh, 1 Peter 3, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Or Paul says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Live at peace with everyone. So we should be modelling that in our preaching because our people need to be living that way. Uh, they shouldn't be trying to win arguments with their neighbours. They should be trying to win people to Christ. Uh, they shouldn't be putting people down, but rather showing that they love their neighbours. We should be the best in the world at loving our neighbours. Uh, so I want to, uh, as best I can, uh, model that uh, in my life and ministry, but also in my preaching. Peter, do you sometimes think, um, I want to lead people to here, and I know they're over here, <laughs> And if I could just get them to hear, that would be, that would be good. I don't have to win everything this talk. Do you, know, do you, yes, do you have well, that kind of thought? Oh, that's quite right. Yes, it's one of the great challenges of ministry that, you know, the aim, as Paul says, is to present everyone mature in Christ. You think, well, that is a very a massive aim. But as we know in our own lives, our, our progress in becoming, uh, being conformed to the image of Christ. Our progress in sanctification is very slow. And uh, we often wonder how God puts up with us. Uh, 
with our continued sins. We try to put them to death every day, but they keep on coming alive again and re-emerging with great energy. Uh, and we have to, uh, uh, we, we praise God for his compassion for us, and we have to uh, express that same compassion to others. I had a preacher say to me recently that uh, he'd, he'd have to give, because of the pressures of COVID restrictions, he was very tired and he'd given up a few uh, extra parish activities. And then he said, but um, the, the people in my church are so slow to take on responsibilities. I said, well, that's because they're exactly in your situation. We're all exhausted by COVID and all the regulations and restrictions and so on and changing our life and work patterns. So we have to be sympathetic uh, to them. And uh, the purpose of God's comfort uh, in, one, in 2 Corinthians 1, of course, is that we're able to comfort others. The danger with being, uh, uh, being a person of high standards, I think, is that we judge ourselves too quickly and judge others too quickly. Uh, now, the opposite of that is being too flabby with ourselves, <laughs> accepting ourselves and all our sins too easily, and then accepting the sins of others too easily. But I think we have to uh, both press on to, the, to our goal in Christ Jesus, but also uh, understand God's compassion with us and with our people. How do we train um, others, our members, to have a good reputation with outsiders and to be hospitable? Oh. You've talked about well, modelling, obviously. But, yes, yeah. and mod modelling is most important, I think. And then encouraging them to do it. So encouraging them uh, not just to evangelise their neighbours, but to love their neighbours. Indeed, mm -hmm. to love their neighbours before they evangelise them. So to be mm -hmm. a good neighbour, a good citizen, a good person at work, uh, useful and, you know, positive and creative and encouraging. Uh, again, not compromising your, your own Christian moral standards, um, but going out of your way to be a helpful person, a positive person. That's right. Hmm. Great. Thank you so much for talking to us this afternoon on The Pastor's Heart. That's a pleasure. Great pleasure, Dominic. Yeah. My guest, Peter Adam, the uh, former principal of uh, Ridley College in Melbourne, and uh, talking to us today on The Pastor's Heart about uh, how hospitality and having a good reputation with outsiders will impact our public communication in the preaching of Christ Jesus. Thanks for being with us, and we'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon.